Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. Feel free to use the chat box for any questions. If we're unable to get to them during the presentation, we'll make sure that they're all answered by the end. My name is Braden Knudsen. I will be your host for this webinar. We'd like to remind everyone that all of these webinars are being recorded and posted onto our BYU Family History Library website as well as the YouTube channel that we have. And we encourage everyone to subscribe and um, so you can receive all the notifications of when new videos are uploaded and, and stay all up to date. Uh, today we'd we will be pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation titled Beginning Latin American Research, Introduction to the Records. James Tanner has a bachelor's degree in Spanish and a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a Juris Doctor degree in law at Arizona State University. He served for two years as an intelligence analyst for the U.S. Army and 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He has previously owned a retail computer business and an Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 32 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star blog and rejoiced and be exceeding glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. He has presented at expos and conferences around the U.S. and Canada. James has seven children and 33 grandchildren. And we'll turn the time over to James now. Howdy, this is James Tanner and welcome you to another uh, BYU Family History Library webinar. Uh, just remind everyone that these webinars, once they are presented, are uploaded to the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. And we'd like to encourage everybody to subscribe to our channel and receive notification of all the videos as they are uploaded. We're going to talk today about beginning Latin American research. Uh, an introduction to the records. Um, we're kind of working this idea of uh, talking about uh, some of the regional areas of the world and the genealogical research things that may go along with those areas of the world. So we'll see how this goes. Um, first of all, ah, this is kind of obvious, but it does help if you know, if you speak Spanish. Uh, if you took Latin in uh, in school. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are, there are still a significant number of people around the United States who are taking Latin as a, as a language. But if you took Spanish in high school or if you took uh, any Spanish at all or speak Spanish in your home or whatever, uh, doing the research is a lot easier, believe me. It just really comes along a little better. Uh, the problem, of course, is it's not a, a complete uh, washout if you don't know how to speak Spanish. Uh, but uh, uh, doing research in a, a target language that is not uh, your native language and one that you do not know can be uh, at least raises some uh, additional preparation standards that you need to know uh, some basic vocabulary. Now, the thing about genealogy is that uh, you can do genealogical research without speaking any of the languages. That's um, literally possible. The problem is that you need to uh, learn a certain core vocabulary uh, or have Google Translate or some other program up that will translate these, the words for you so that you can uh, work your way through the records. Um, so this is, uh, this is just kind of the threshold issue of, of uh, people who are non-Spanish uh, speakers. As I mentioned here, it isn't absolutely necessary. You can you can make good progress in doing research if you take the time to uh, learn the core words. Uh, as I mentioned, you can use Google Translate. Google Translate is a uh, free program from Google. If you type translate into uh, any Google search, it will come up as the first item. And uh, it, uses, it gives you two blocks, uh, one on the right and one on the left. You type in what you want to translate uh, to, from, uh, and you can switch back and forth with the little arrows in the middle of the translate section. Uh, they also have down in the corner that you can almost barely see on this slide a keyboard. And this keyboard changes for each of the languages. Uh, there's close to 100 languages now that Google translates. And uh, the keyboard changes for each of the languages. So in Spanish, if you're using the keyboard, you can enter the NEA and things like that that you probably wouldn't be able. That's a little squiggle sign over the N that you uh, uh, can put in and type, actually learn to, to type the la in the language and use all of what they call diacritical marks, the marks that on top of the words that change the, the, the words. 
uh, under, thing to understand, one thing to understand about Spanish is that there are a couple of extra letters in the alphabet. There's a double L and an N, -Y, which is the N with the little mark over it. And those are both separate letters, and they're alphabetized separately. So you, when you try to get, uh, start looking in the alphabet and start looking for things, you'll find out that dictionaries and and uh, other items usually put, if those things are at the first of a word or near the first of a word, they have a tendency to change the alphabetizing. There are actually a few words in Spanish that begin with an N, -Y, with an N with a little mark over the top. And uh, those words are actually separately set apart in, uh, in dictionaries. So a few things like this that you might have to learn about the language. If you type into Google Translate on the, on the left-hand side and have it going from English to Spanish, uh, as you type in the word father, it will then put in padre. And if you put the mother, madre, and so forth, birth, nacimiento, and death, muerte. And so you can just, uh, you can create what would essentially be a genealogical word list in Spanish uh, sort of on the fly. Um, and that is very helpful in uh, trying to translate some words that may be uh, very even unfamiliar to a speaker of Spanish. I do find people who are fluent in Spanish who have difficulty translating these old records. So it's not uh, necessarily a guarantee that because you know how to speak Spanish that you'll be able to do this easily. Um, first, a little history. It's, it's kind of helpful to know uh, a little bit about these countries in Latin America. Uh, before you get started uh, doing research. Um, uh, primary reason, of course, is that the history in Latin America is uh, substantially different than uh, what we've had here in the United States. And uh, what is available, what they've done, and what their government structures are, are all reflection of uh, the fact that they started out in the Spanish Empire. Uh, so it's nice to know this kind of information. We have a picture right here of uh, uh, taken on the spot when Columbus uh, discovered America? Obviously not. But uh, this is where Columbus arrived in 1492. Uh, I think in the old days when you were in grade school, you learned the, uh, you know, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and arrived in America in 1492. I don't think school kids could probably cough up with that date anymore. But uh, you might want to know that's when we started the, when Spain started uh, conquering most of what was known as America at that time. And uh, it's a good, good uh, kind of watershed date. Uh, I might also point out that there are no records in America before 1492. So it's not kind of not a point when you're not going to go back and look for them. Um, I used to have discussions with my professors at the University of Utah when I was majoring in Spanish. Because I was aware of written records, obviously, in ancient America before the Spanish arrived. And there were certain professors, particularly one I had from Chile, who was adamant that, there, that none of the Native Americans ever had any written languages. And uh, I used to point out the fact that, well, why did the Spanish burn all the records when they came to America then, if they weren't written? Um, of course, that only made him mad. I, had to get a grade, so I didn't necessarily get in too big, big of an argument there. But uh, uh, those records are not generally available and, and uh, obviously not being used for genealogical purposes. Um, it is a fact that very little, if any, Latin American history is taught in US public schools. So uh, unless you happen to major in Spanish and or take uh, courses specifically in Latin American history, it is very unlikely that you have even the sketchiest idea about what happened after Columbus arrived in 1492. Uh, you might have some idea about uh, Cortez in Mexico, and you might pick up Pizarro in Peru uh, if you've watched some TV or something. But uh, generally speaking, Americans are woefully uh, misinformed. Um, here's another fact. I, used, I taught Spanish at uh, college level for uh, quite a few years. And uh, one of the things that I would teach in the classes is I would ask, uh, we were in Arizona and we were in Mesa, Arizona, which is only oh, about 150 miles north of the Mexican border in uh, and, uh, Mexico. And I would uh, ask people in the beginning of the class, I'd say, 
how many of you can tell me the name of the state just south of Arizona? And most of them would sit there and stare at me for maybe, you know, I wouldn't say anything. I'd just wait. They'd all stare at me, and I'd go, hey, what do you mean? They'd, and finally somebody would say, there aren't any states south of Arizona. What are you talking about? I'd say, yeah, there are. What's the name of the state just south of Arizona? And they'd go, and, and it was, I don't think in five years or so that I taught Spanish at, at Mesa Community College, anybody ever answered that question. I think there might have been one or two at the most that even started to guess what I was getting at. The name of the country. Then I would say, well, okay, then what's the name of the country that's just south of, of uh, Arizona? And they'd all go, Mexico. And I said, no, what's the, the, the name of the country, the whole name of the country? You know, this is America, but what's the name of this country? And they say, oh, it's the United States of America. And I'd say, yeah, that's, that's what we call it. And I said, so what do the Mexicans call it? And they'd all sit there and stare at me. And I said, well, it's, it's called the Estados Unidos de Mexico. It's the United States of Mexico. Okay, I said, so why are they calling it the United States of Mexico? And then the answer would be, oh, do they have states? <laughs> and I said, hence my first question is, which state <laughs> is directly south of, Ar of Arizona? And they would all go, oh. And I'd say, which state? And they'd go, we don't know. I'd say, how about Sonora? Oh, you mean Sonora is a state? <laughs> we go down to Rocky Point all the time. I said, well, that's, yeah, okay. Anyway, there's some interesting problems when we start talking about the, the knowledge of, of uh, English-speaking North Americans in, uh, about their Spanish-speaking neighbors to the south. Uh, and it, unfortunately, of course, this is, has a great uh, bearing on, on the amount of, of uh, research that has been done or the ability to, of people in the United States who speak English, who even if they have Spanish heritage, to do research in Latin American countries. So now it's kind of important to know some of these dates because they establish when certain records may have become available. So we, we understand the first permanent European settlement was at Santo Domingo, now in the Dominican Republic in 1496. This is the first permanent European European settlement in America, in the America on this side of the ocean. So uh, understanding that uh, we're not going to go too far, farther back than 1500 in, uh, in any kind of records in America. Uh, whereas in Europe, obviously, you can go back further if, you, if you're doing specialized research. Um, this is an interesting side note uh, for those who are uh, under, trying to understand how uh, a small handful of Europeans was able to conquer an entire uh, continent, in a sense, full of millions of people. Well, uh, what has happened over the years in the studies, and this is not unfortunately not even repeated in most of the histories of Latin America, but it was clear that shortly, or beginning at the time of the European contact, many of the common European diseases like smallpox and uh, some of the other diseases uh, were non-existent in America and spread essentially uh, as huge plagues across North America and South America and decimated uh, the estimates run as high in some places as 90% of the population was destroyed. And in a lot of cases, the, the structure, the social structure uh, that had been created over centuries of, uh, with the Native American populations uh, were in shambles. They were totally destroyed. So uh, any explanation of why the, the Spanish conquistadores could, uh, could have walked in and taken over the Mexican Empire, for example, was was uh, are probably due to the fact that, that they were in, in uh, social and political upheaval due to, to the plagues that had occurred. Uh, so there's really kind of a, an interesting background here. Um, this is one that you probably have heard about, or at least uh, if, if anything you know about uh, Latin American history, you heard about Hernan Cortes and uh, conquering the Aztecs. Uh, it took him three years. 1519 to 1521, and it was only because he was able to gain support from uh, 
opposing parties among the Aztecs uh, and use the Indians uh, to attack the Indians. Um, now, uh, there are those now who would uh, be censoring us instantly if we use the term Indian as if it were a non uh, not acceptable, politically incorrect term. Um, in in the, what the the problem with that term is that there is no consensus among the people who are Indians who <laughs> as to whether or not they accept it. The term Native American, which is uh, supposedly the political correct politically correct term, is not necessarily as well accepted as some other uh, so-called politically correct things. So uh, we do have to refer to them as Indians because that's the way they're referred to in all of the literature and currently among uh, most of the, the people in Latin America. Um, as far as the part of, of uh, the empire, Spanish empire, that uh, came to the United States, the portion we call the United States today in North America, uh, St. Augustine, Florida <clears throat> was founded in 1565. What, what you need to understand is that most U.S. histories view the establishment of uh, the United States from either Jamestown in 1605 or uh, Plymouth colony in 1620. So, uh, you know, they're about 40 to 50 years off of when they actually, Europeans actually were well established in in the American on the American continent, um, part of this, of course, is because the winners get to write the history, and uh, the Spanish didn't win that portion uh, of the uh, of the wars between the various countries. Um, interesting to know about the desert south about the Southwest uh, part of the United States, the Spanish reached northern New Mexico in 1598, so they were clear up into northern New Mexico. Uh, but by the pueblos in Taos and San, what's now Santa Fe, um, long before the pilgrims per arrived in, in Plymouth, Massachusetts. So uh, interestingly enough, if you want to know this as a fact, uh, there are families in New Mexico and Arizona whose ancestry dates back in America to the 1500s. And uh, so if we want to talk about blue blood, old time U.S., families uh, that were established from colonial days, uh, those, those families in the Southwest have us all be, they're, uh, they're, they're well in advance of any of the English or French settlers that made it to America. Um, so Santa Fe was established in 1610, uh, 10 years before the Plymouth colony. So this is kind of, once you start getting this kind of perspective about uh, Latin America and, uh, and Mexico and the other countries, uh, you can begin to understand uh, some, of the, uh, some of the attitudes that people might have, uh, both for and you know, in favor and against uh, uh, current problems with immigrants and things like that. So... Um, I think some of us can remember, and in fact, uh, when this particular presentation is being given, we're in November of 2016, and we're coming up to a holiday in the United States called Thanksgiving, when we celebrate these 1620 pilgrims who came over from England and some of the things they, they are associated with our holiday. Um, uh, yeah, you can see the dates there. <laughs> um, Here's the, uh, the first carving away of the Spanish Empire as far as the United States was concerned. It's called the Spanish Session East and West Florida in 1819. Um, this is when, after the establishment of the United States of America, uh, the United States had what was called Manifest Destiny. They were out to grab all the land in North America. And, um, oh, that was probably an ill-used Ill word. They were that they were going to acquire all the land in North America. Uh, the first of that was uh, was working with Spain in the sense of uh, saying we want Florida, and Spain was not in a position to contest that claim, and so they they ceded their claim to to Florida in 1819. 
Then we have what's called the Mexican Cession in 1848. This wasn't quite as peaceful as what happened when Spain decided to give up Florida. Uh, the United States sent an army down to Mexico City to take over the country and then just simply took this portion of the proper, of the land uh, by, uh, by brute force and after signing a treaty acquired uh, the interest from Mexico, which by that time was, was, uh, had separated from Spain uh, and uh, acquired what uh, that part in red, which uh, is California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, part of New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming. Um, actually, the boundaries of this Mexican session were totally unknown. Nobody had a clue as to what they were actually, they were getting back in 1848. Uh, roughly speaking, they knew that uh, there was a boundary to the east because they used the, uh, the Rio Grande River that was running down through New Mexico as the as part of what they'd already claimed from Texas. But uh, the United States obtained this in 1848. So the, the reason why this is pertinent, very pertinent to genealogical research is you understand that any records in 18, before 1848 in this part of the United States are probably either Mexican records or they were somehow transferred from this part of the country back to whoever was, was running uh, that particular colony or that settlement uh, if it was out here. Uh, for those of you who uh, are aware of Utah, uh, Utah was settled by Mormon pioneers in 1847 and yes, they were in Mexico at the time that they went into the, uh, to the Salt Lake Valley. So um, interesting kind of uh, a twist on history. Um, the last piece of the puzzle of the United States, uh, the southern 48 states, uh, was the Gadsden Purchase in 1853. Uh, you'll see there that it goes straight across from New Mexico and then it angles towards the northwest uh, up to just south of what is now Yuma. Well, Yuma was actually there in 1853. Yuma's been there for a long time because uh, it was on the Colorado River and it was a place where they crossed the Colorado River. So it wasn't a community of any size, but it was in existence. But the interesting thing is that upward northwest slant. Now, had the story variously of the surveyors who did the Gadsden Purchase was that they were all drunk uh, when they started that turn <laughs> and just kept going straight until they hit the Colorado River. If they had not done that, if they had simply con uh, continued with the east-west line over to the Gulf of California, uh, that would have put Yuma further south and would have had a seaport in Arizona. My, my supposition has always been that had that occurred, Phoenix would not only have been there, probably not even it existed, but Yuma probably would have been one of the largest, three largest cities in the, in the United States. So this is kind of an interesting uh, observation on the way that all this stuff worked. The date here is 1853, so uh, it was pretty late in the history of the, uh, just right before the Civil War. And you need to remember this, that we have Spanish-speaking people in the United States that, that were living in this country long before the pilgrims arrived. Uh, so uh, some, of my, uh, some of the people that I know in Arizona and New Mexico can trace their ancestry back uh, to the 1500s uh, in Mexico. And they were, they've lived in the same place, their families lived in the same place ever since then. So what is Latin America? Latin America is that portion of the world that speaks Spanish. <laughs> Except for um, uh, Brazil, which speaks Portuguese. Uh, that's another kind of interesting topic. Um, Portuguese is different from Spanish, but it's not different enough from Spanish to, to, from some people's opinion to actually be a separate language. It is uh, and because Spain at the time, uh, Portugal and Spain, had many different languages, Catalan and, and other languages that were spoken in, that, in, the, in the Iberian Peninsula where, where Spain is located. 
So it's kind of, yeah, they're both Latin American languages. They're both derived from Latin. And all of these countries in green, plus the Caribbean, many of the Caribbean islands, the only little part that's sort of cut out of South America that's not considered Latin is uh, the two colonies, the Guianas uh, up there that were British and French um, on the north coast, which are now independent countries. So all the Spanish-speaking and Portuguese countries in North, Central, and South America and the Caribbean, including Mexico, are all in Latin America. Now, Mexico is considered part of North America. And most geographic designations consider Central America to be separate from South America. So there's really three parts of the American continents. You have North America, you have Central America, and then you have South America. Can you name all of those countries? I used to give a test when I was teaching Spanish on uh, having the students. I'd tell them, I'd tell them, you know, they're going to have a test. The test is going to be real simple. I'm going to give you a map, and you're going to need to name all the countries and the capitals. I just thought this was, you know, kind of basic stuff that somebody who, was, who wanted to learn Spanish should know uh, about all the Spanish-speaking countries. That was really about the most disastrous test that I ever gave anybody. That was really bad. I mean, I don't think I had more than a handful of students over five years who, who even came close to doing that. Uh, the, the, in other words, the, the simple fact is that, that uh, being able to even acknowledge what those countries are uh, is uh, miserably missing from American uh, education system. Okay, so what's the key to Latin American research? The key to Latin American research is to identify the parish church or town where your ancestors lived. This is the whole key to it. Now, by the way, this happens to be the key in England and in Germany and in most of the Western European countries and in the Eastern European countries and most of the Mediterranean countries. Oh, well. By the way, this is the way outside of the United States that we do a lot of our research, is to uh, identify the parish in a parish. Now, let me tell you what parish is. And uh, basically, this is uh, an issue uh, having to do with the Catholic Church and uh, other churches like the Lutheran Church in Germany and Scandinavia and the, um, and the Church of England and other derivatives of the Catholic Church. Uh, because the organization of the church was based on having a central church or cathedral or whatever. It's called the church. And the church building was the center of a parish. A parish was like a, a, a smaller geographic area presided over by a priest. Uh, the parishes, a number of parishes were gathered into what was called a diocese. And obviously there's names in Spanish, parochia for the parishes and diocese for the diocese. And uh, the diocese was, was presided over by a bishop. And then there was an archbishop who uh, was usually in charge of a number of dioceses. And so these, this organization of the Catholic Church uh, uh, was the way in which records were created and maintained. So the parish priest from ancient times had the, the, the uh, obligation to uh, record all of the births, marriages, and deaths, and burials, if that, in that case, and confirmations of the church. And so they, they would cre maintain what are called parish registers, registros parochiales. And uh, these would be the, one, the records that would be kept by the, the, uh, the Catholic Church. So this is kind of the, the place. But in order for you to do any research uh, for anyone, for yourself, your ancestors, if they came from Latin America, uh, the key there is going to be identifying the, the parish the place where they exactly lived. And by and large, uh, all of your ancestors are going to have come from that parish or some of the very close um, uh, adjoining parishes, as is the case in England and to some extent in uh, Scandinavia. When you get back into the early 1800s, what you have is a um, uh, 
situation where people did not move, had no mobility, and so once you identify the, the church and the parish, you generally have uh, sort of an open uh, re uh, research field to go out and find all of the people who may be related to you. And there are three main kinds of records that were kept in Latin America. Uh, obviously, there's lots of other records. It's just like any other country. The government creates a lot of records, and there's various uh, other records around. But these are the main types of records that we use for uh, genealogical research. First of all, as I mentioned, parish registers or parish records. Uh, these uh, record vital records, as I mentioned, by uh, births, which are called baptisms or christenings. Uh, that's another interesting uh, point that needs to be brought up. The, the christening was done shortly after birth or not. Um, what would happen in, in some cases is that uh, the people would either not take their children to the church because of a distance factor or because they simply had no money to pay the priest or because they simply were didn't have the time or whatever to do it. They were just inertia. They didn't do it. And uh, sometimes people would get baptized. They'd go to the church to get married, and the priest would say, sorry, I can't marry you because you weren't baptized. So they would have to get baptized before they got married. Uh, so and assuming that a baptismal record or a christening record uh, in, the, in the Catholic Church was at or near the time of birth is not necessarily correct. Uh, one other thing that happened is that uh, in order to in order to get kind of a volume discount, uh, I'm being a little bit flippant there. Uh, sometimes the families would wait. They had eight or nine children, then they'd get them all together and take them down and get them baptized all at once. Uh, literally, this is what you'll find. You'll find the whole family baptized on the on the parish registers on the same day. So. Uh, parish records are very complete, they're very thorough, and uh, they're fairly accurate. They're at least as accurate as the priest was able to spell people's names. Now in the Americas what happened with the parish registers was that um, the Spanish came in and, be and started to uh, impose the Catholic Church on the population. and. Uh, that's one of the bad parts of the history of Latin America. But um, what happened from a genealogical standpoint is that because the Catholic Church considered all of the Indian names to be, to be a pagan, uh, they were unacceptable for the church. Unfortunately, in the oldest records, in, in the parish records from Latin America, when the um, Indians were baptized, the Native Americans were baptized, uh, christened into the Catholic Church, they got a Christian name. Well, the priests were not overly imaginative. And in some of the parish registers, every single one of the Native Americans baptized was called either Juan, if male, or Maria, if female. So you have absolutely no way of differentiating between these people at the, at the very initial uh, read of the, of the parish registers. So. Uh, it's kind of interesting. There's lots of things like that, plus the fact that that Juan and Maria are still the most popular Spanish names, and uh, many people in Latin America still have that name, even though they may have another name that they use on a common basis. Uh, by the way, the name Maria is also used for males as well as females in Latin America, so uh, that may become upsetting to some people, but that's what happened. Uh, the second group of records is the civil registration records. Um, depending on the country and depending on the time frame when they began keeping these records uh, and whether or not these records were preserved, uh, they, they started primarily around the 1850s uh, when most of the countries in Latin America had obtained um, uh, their independence from Spain. So these are the, the records that were kept by the Spanish, uh, by, the rule, by the governments of the various Latin American countries after the Spanish rule. Now, what happened before that time was that the Spanish government kept records as well as the parish registers. 
But here we have another one, uh, census records. Many of the countries have census records. Argentina and, and Peru and other places had, did census records. Uh, I just put one example up here. We have the 1930 Mexico census, which is, by the way, the only existing uh, census of the entire country of Mexico. Uh, and it's not complete, but it is an excellent beginning point for people whose ancestors came from Mexico uh, after 1930. Okay, so we're going to give an example here of Mexico, and uh, I do that because the, the vast majority of, uh, of Spanish-speaking people in the United States have origin in Mexico. Uh, these are the 32 states of Mexico. Uh, you can see Sonora up there just south of uh, Arizona. Uh, Baja California. Um, um, if you're from California, you already know about Baja, uh, but uh, that's two states, Baja California and Baja California Sur. It's sometimes called Baja California Norte and Baja California Sur, South and North Baja. Um, so it's two different states. And then all of the other different colored states are the states of Mexico down to uh, Guatemala, which is the, co the country on the southern border of Mexico. So here's a list of the states. If you go to the FamilySearch.org catalog uh, on the FamilySearch.org website, uh, click on search, go to the catalog, go put in Mexico as a place, and then uh, click after that to places within Mexico, then you'll get an automatic listing of all the states uh, of, the, of the country. Mexico does also has what's called a, a federal district, just like the District of Columbia in the United States. Um, they have the federal district of Mexico. Uh, any confusion that comes from the fact that the capital of the, of the country of Mexico is also called Mexico is doesn't make really, it doesn't, it doesn't bother anybody except North Americans, so we don't really worry about it too much. Um, if you ask somebody if they're from Mexico, that means uh, you're asking them if they're from the city <laughs> most of the time, uh, because that's what they uh, that's what they consider to be the Mexico. Uh, now we're going to use an example of Sonora. If I were to further use the catalog of the FamilySearch.org catalog and clicked on Sonora, then I would get a list of all the places within Sonora. And these would be a mixture of what are called civil and ecclesiastical parishes um, and municipalities. So they're kind of mixed up in here. Some of them have uh, municipio, municipio uh, after them in parentheses. That means they're a municipality. That's a civil subdivision of the state, like a county in the United States. Um, otherwise, what you have in Mexico are primarily parishes, uh, either civil or, um, like I said, ecclesiastical, meaning they're church parishes as well as, as state divisions. Um, that can get a little bit confusing, but as far as the records are concerned, we're concerned church records with the ecclesiastical uh, parishes, uh, governmental records like census records and uh, civil registrations may also be divided down into the civil parishes, which in many, many cases correspond, uh, as far as the boundaries correspond, to the, the ecclesiastical parishes. So it's not really a problem, but you need to know that, those, that that division exists if you're going to start working with records in Mexico. So now we look at the Mexican records on FamilySearch.org. Um, I've heard variously uh, that the estimate is that well over 90%, and I've heard as high as 98% of the Mexican records have, have, been, did, have been microfilmed uh, and are available through Family Search. And from my perception is that, that most of those records have now been digitized. Um, I'm still finding occasionally a few records from Mexico that are not digitized but uh, most of them can now be digitized and searched online. Um, and, and this is kind of an editorial comment in a way. Uh, the indexes that are being done, you 
was talking about indexing records a lot. And the indexes that are being done in uh, Latin America are uh, almost not helpful. Um, I'm going to have to say that. The reason is that um, most Spanish-speaking people have compound surnames. Um, if your name was Luis and your last name and your father's name was Sanchez and your mother's name was uh, Rodriguez, then your name would be Luis Sanchez Rodriguez. Uh, sometimes there's an E added in the middle, an and, a Y that stands for and in Spanish. And so the name could be Luis Sanchez E. Rodriguez. Um, and so uh, the problem when they're indexing the records is do you index it under the father's name or under the mother's name and then what happens if for any reason that particular person did not conform to the standard. Now this is the case we found today doing some research in, in Spanish records this morning uh, was that uh, the, the child was named uh, the, the father's name in this case was, uh, surname was uh, Rodriguez, and the mother's surname was Guzman, and the child's name was Guzman. So what happened? The answer to that is probably that the father and the mother weren't married, and that the child took the mother's name. So that's all sorts of things. Now, the problem with the indexing is figure all that out, folks, and try and get a form that you can enter that will reflect that all of those variations. The answer is you're really kind of stuck looking through the records for your people, especially if you don't find them immediately with an index. Sometimes the index are very helpful in getting to your information. Sometimes, even though you have an index, it's absolutely necessary to go look through the records individually to search through uh, the parish registers or whatever before you find it. So now, for example, if I click on one of those records, I'll see two different types here. I'll see Mexico Campeche Catholic Church records, and then I'll see Mexico Campeche civil registration records. And one of them has a number, which means at least that number of records have been digitized. Uh, I might mention on Family Search, you want to check, click on the name of the records to see how many total records there are to see whether the number of digitized records matches the number of total records. If they aren't very close, then that means only a few of those records have been uh, indexed. So any index, even in that case, will not be very helpful. The little cameras over at the left-hand side mean there are images. So you can go through and, and search these records directly which is uh, really the best way to, to uh, find Latin American records. So now I'm going to look at the Mexico Campeche civil registration records, and we'll see that it says browse through 78,000 images. Well, OK. Uh, it may take you a little while. No, the answer is this, that they're, they're usually very well organized by place. And that's why I started at the beginning of this by saying that it was absolutely necessary to know where your people came from and where you're going in, in the sense of the parish, which is the smallest geographic area. Now, even within a parish, you might have 50 or 100 people with the name of Juan Lopez. And so it's like John Smith. And so it, you really need to be more specific and, and look for the patterns of the families. Um, and, and find out because most of these parish registers will give not only the name of the child being baptized, but they will give the name of the parents and in many cases the name of the godparents who would be, uh, who in some registration, some English translations call sponsors and that's, I don't know what they, where they got that, but uh, they are uh, people who are related, usually related to the child and in most cases, they're the grandparents or one of the grandparents and from each side, from the husband and from the wife's side of the, of the baby's family. Okay, so we're, you know, we're moving on into the records. Now, here's, for example, what happens when you, when you break down the civil registrations. In this case, you have defunciones, which are the death records, and matrimonios, which are the marriage records, and nacimientos on the right, uh, and you can see the year spread. So, 
if you know approximately or even if you know it then exactly the, the date of any one of those events in your ancestor's life, then it's pretty simple to go find it. You just go to that and start, go to the date because these are all organized uh, strictly chronologically and uh, then uh, you can pick up the record. Uh, I mean, we, uh, this morning in doing research uh, in the uh, civil registration records, uh, we knew an approximate date, but we knew the place where these people lived. And when we know the place, we were able to go, meaning the parish, we were able to go right to the record, and there was only one person with the name of, of the person we were looking for in that parish at that time. So it was simple. We found the person. Uh, so this is kind of the, uh, there, there's ways of getting around not having uh, uh, workable indexes for these records. So now uh, you can choose the, uh, the exact air time frame of the record that you're looking for and get right into the records. This is what a parish record would look like. The interesting thing about the Catholic parishes in Latin America is that the priests, because it was all the Catholic Church uh, and because the Catholic Church is, was pretty well organized uh, throughout its history in Latin America and still is, um, the priests followed a specific format for every entry. So every christening or baptismal entry and every de uh, death record and every uh, marriage records are worded almost identically throughout the whole records from 1500 through to the present. So you can, you can go back in and, and even if you can only pick out a few words, you can read a, a, a birth record or a, or a marriage record simply because they're all the same. And so you know where to look for the names and you know where to look for the godparents and the parents and all the places and the dates and everything else. So uh, having to be able to read every word, uh, I can. it's helpful to know what they say in the beginning, but there's many places where they translate it. You can find online, like for instance, from the Family Search Research Wiki, uh, they'll give you a, a vocabulary list of all the, all the words used in, uh, in birth records, for example, and you have it. You have what you need to do, the translation, even if you don't speak Spanish. It helps, though. Like I said earlier at the beginning, it helps. Um, so basically, if you get into the record, um, in almost all cases, uh, on the, in the margin of the, of the record is the name of the person, either, either the name of the people getting married or the, or the, person, uh, the person who is born, uh, being christened and uh, the person who died. Uh, so they're kind of, you read down the margins, you can skip all that stuff and look for the names of the people that may correspond to your person's name. You just might be careful, however, because uh, if a name has become Americanized, they may have dropped either the, the father's name or the mother's name, depending on how the person chose to be called. So your Juan Gonzalez here in the United States or John Gonzalez here in the United States may, uh, in fact, not be John Gonzalez in Mexico. He may be Juan uh, with two or three middle names and uh, his father's and his mother's names. So we just uh, you, you're not going to be able to just find somebody named Juan Gonzalez. Okay, so first of all, over here on the side is the name, and then over here is all the information about the um, uh, Baptism. One of the things you want to make sure you don't pick up is the name of the priest who always appears at the beginning and don't assume that's the name of your ancestor uh, because the priest is going to put his name in there first. Um, once a year, by the way, uh, the bishops would come around to most of the parishes. Uh, the, the practice was to come to all the parishes and make an extra copy. The bishop himself didn't do this. He had people with him who did it. Um, but they would come around and make a copy of all the parish registers. So they were called bishops' transcripts, and they're essentially just a, an extra copy of these records. Many times, not many times, actually surprisingly few times in Latin America, depend, uh, considering how many different revolutions and wars and things they've had internally uh, in some of these countries, very few of these records have been lost because of that. They're usually lost because they get stacked in piles and and disintegrate uh, long before they get burned or anything. 
uh, Catholic churches were like fortresses back then, and so uh, and they still are. And so uh, it's you know they weren't the first buildings to get burned. Uh, plus the fact, even on both sides, they were still all Catholics, and so they respected usually respected the church property. So you didn't get as many burned records as you do in in places like Southern United States or Ireland or some places where they like to burn records regularly. Okay, so here is a parish record. Uh, we're going to search that. Uh, this is the Mexico Campeche Catholic Church record. I did choose this kind of randomly, so it's not like I was doing any re research in that particular state. But okay, so now we've got a list of the cities or towns. So once again, you've got to you've got to be able to identify your uh, ancestors' place of origin. That's really the biggest obstacle to doing any kind of research in Latin America from an, from the United States, from English speaking standpoint. Uh, the people uh, basically you're going to have to go back to the grandparents and determine when they came to America and figure out exactly which town they they started from. Now, many, many people can tell me when I ask them, oh, where did your grandparents come from? They came from Mexico. What is the town did they come from? Uh, they came from, you know, town in Campeche or whatever. And then, then you could say, uh, and then you say, well, what was the name of their church? Where, which church did they have? And they can, they can tell you. But a lot of people have forgotten that information, and that's the, uh, the big challenge to... Um, to finding the, the records uh, across the border. But once you've done that, once you bridge that gap, the gap of the place where the people, the church where the people were, were baptized or um, married, then uh, you have, uh, it's kind of an open field to finding the records. So then you choose the, the type of record from the place and then you're right back into the, uh, the parish registers. And the, the, yeah, they all look just like this. Um, you look at records from any one of the Spanish-speaking countries, including, by the way, Italy, Spain, uh, most of the, the southern Latin uh, countries, uh, France. Uh, if you go into uh, uh, Catholic records in England, they look just like this. So you're, you basically have got the same kinds of records. And so you look at it again, and there's the name, and there's the information about the baptism. Okay, now you have census records, and it, this is, it's, it's, uh, one of the uh, a census sheet. Uh, looks very, very similar, of course, to what we have in the United States. Um, uh, kind of the same type of ideas. Censuses, uh, worldwide censuses had uh, sort of a general uh, consensus bin, uh, origin in all the different countries. So now you can look at the census record, go down and figure out. Uh, again, you're going to have to know where the people came from in order to get into the records. So you can search for records by country on familysearch.org. The reason why I come to familysearch.org in uh, talking about Latin American records is the, the countries themselves do have records, and they do have records online. Um, and it, they are some of them are accessible, but the biggest collection of records of Latin American records is in FamilySearch.org. Period. There's the other websites. Uh, Ancestry just picked up a, a large number of, uh, of and has indexed a large number of, of parish register records and civil records in Mexico. But other than that, uh, most of the country, most of the big online websites have yet to to make a big inroad into a Latin American records. OK, so here we go. Just an example, if we chose Chile down in uh, South America, uh, Family Search has uh, a little over 4 million indexed records and uh, uh, close to 5 million images. Uh, the records cover the years 1500 to 2013. And there are seven different collections. And so you find the same thing uh, throughout Latin America. The records are going to be are going to be very similar from country to country. Not going to find a lot of of um, difference. Now, as you're mentioning, as I mentioned, if you're searching the parish registers, 
The key here is you look for the first person you can identify in the christening, marriage, or death records. So anybody you find. So if you just happen to know when your grandfather died and you knew he was from this little pueblito, little tiny town in, in Mexico, uh, then you can go to the parish registers and you find his birth record because he died in the United States, for example. And so you go back and find his birth record. Once you find that first person's birth record, you there. You search forward and backwards in time, entry by entry for additional family members. You go two years for births, approximately, 18 to 20 years for marriage, and then you look for an age in, in, uh, and look for the age in death records. So uh, what you'll find in the parish registers is they'll, that sometimes uh, they'll have a section in the parish register for births, a section for marriages, and a section for deaths. Uh, sometimes they'll have separate books. Sometimes they'll be set up on family search in different microfilm roles. Um, so there's different ways, but you're going to be looking through all three of those kinds of records, plus a fourth record, which are called confirmation records, which usually occurred when a child was around 14 years of age. Um, and uh, so there's confirmation records for 14-year-old in Latin America. Uh, so if we're looking at baptismal records, you'll usually get the date of the event, the place of the event, the name of the child, the birth date of the child. Sometimes, sometimes they'll actually have the birth date. It'll say, say, nació el niño and give a date. The, the baby was born on such and such a date. But I wouldn't be, you know, I'm, not, I'm always surprised to find the birth date, uh, pleasantly surprised when I find the birth date, um, because it's kind of like a bonus. You don't always get that. Then you get the parents' names, uh, the parents of the child names, and um, then you also get the child's name, and you get the parents' origin and residence. <clears throat> the priest is always careful to tell uh, that uh, somebody, the parents either were residents of the parish or not. Um, and they also tell whether or not the parents were baptized or not, or, which means they were married in the church or not. So a child could be a child legitimo or legitima, which means a legitimate child meant that the parents were baptized and married in the church, or a child natural, which was a child that was illegitimate, not that it was born out of wedlock in our sense, but because the, if they were married civilly and not married in the church, the child was still not considered to be legitimate. Okay, so uh, you have to get into this stuff or you don't understand what you're reading there. And uh, so in confirmation records, you have the name, the age, the parents' names, and, the and whether the person is legitimate or not, meaning the parents were married in the church or not. And the names of the godparents, who are um, the people who, and often in the, um, often you'll have godparents in the uh, baptismal records also. And marriage records, you'll have the date of the marriage, the place of the marriage, the name of the groom and bride, uh, the groom's name, age, origin, and residence, uh, the names of the groom's parents, and then the bride's name, age, origin, and residence, and the names of the bride's parents, and the names of witnesses. Now, this is why if you find one of these records, you have the names, usually have the names of the parents. So now uh, you just have to go back and fill in all the children and then go back to find the parents' marriage record and then go back and find their birth records and then you'll find the next generation's parents and the next generation's parents and keep going back. And many of my friends have taken records back uh, to getting hundreds and hundreds of records going clear back into the 1500s at just by keeping persistently going and looking through. Now, when you get into these smaller parishes, you end up being uh, related, the people end up being related to everybody in the parish, and eventually you're just simply getting, putting all the names together and showing the families and how you are all related to everybody. So it, it, it it's, uh, and some people uh, can get a roll of microfilm or now a digital file online, and that's it. They spend the rest of their time, uh, their life, doing re uh, research in that one file. That's the way it works. 
Uh, divorce records, by the way, are extremely rare. <laughs> Uh, the Catholic Church is not a fan of divorces, and um, you sometimes get the debate of divorce, the name of the husband, the name of the wife, and the times separated prior to the divorce, uh, but that doesn't always happen. Um, I really can't recall having seen a divorce record in Latin America, so I, I'm sure they're there, but I don't think I've ever looked, had to research one. Death records, date of the death, place of the death, name and origin of the deceased and the age of the deceased, parents' names of the deceased, spouses' names of the deceased. Now, if you do record in records in um, in uh, uh, England, for example, you're going to be wondering why the English parish priests wrote so little information down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it really makes me upset when I'm reading English parish records. A death record in England, by the way, says the name of the deceased the day they were buried. That's it. And that is about as helpful as nothing when you've got everybody with the same name in the same parish. So, anyway, translation, births or christenings or nacimientos or bautismos, confirmaciones, confirmations, Defunciones, muerto, is death, but they call them defunciones sometimes. Enterramientos, burials, matrimonios, marriages, and that's it. The rule here is to keep looking because you will find the records and you will then have the key to discovering a great ancestry. Thanks for watching. And Thank you for coming once again to the BYU Family History Library webinars, and we remind you that these webinars will be posted on our BYU Family History Library YouTube channel, and please take the time to click the button and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com, look for BYU Family History Library, and we have uh, close to 200 videos, and by the time you watch this, we may have many more. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, and for all the effort that you've put into preparing for us. I'd like to remind everyone to go check out our website and look at our schedule for the upcoming webinars that we have this month, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you.